Well, good afternoon, everybody. I wake you up, right? <laughs> All right. So I think the gentleman to my left here, Mayor uh, Panto, does probably doesn't need an introduction. Although we are going, Neil's going to give him a, a good formal introduction. But uh, Mayor, we have a little ceremony we go through before we kick things off. So we'll uh, we'll get things going. Uh, everybody, like to rise for the pledge, please. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands. One, one nation under God, and there is a result of the liberty of the Catholic God. God bless America. Not exactly uh, Kate Smith, but not bad. <laughs> Actually, that was that was better than most of the places I've heard. <laughs> All right. Well, we we have the mayor here, so I think we'll we'll have plenty, plenty of inspiration. Oh. Uh, inspiration. Um, all right. Well, first of all, welcome to our uh, Zoom folks. I'll turn it over to Neil, who will uh, introduce our our guest. I have this whole dossier, but I think don't don't read that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to read a few things. Uh, mayor Pano is in his fifth consecutive term as mayor. In November 2019, South Pantio Jr. was re-elected, capturing 82% of the votes and sweeping every ward in the city. He also served two terms as mayor from 1984 to 1992. When he was re-elected at the age of 31, uh, he was the uh, city's youngest mayor. Uh, some of the other things that, that I'll just highlight here, uh, when he took over the city, the city had a triple B rating on standards and pours, and at one time it, it earned an A-plus rating. Uh, and that for the first time in five years, the city is actually, population is growing. I assume that's attributed to all the housing that's being developed in Easton. Uh, Mayor Piano earned his master's degree from Lehigh University and his bachelor's from uh, Kutztown University. In May 2011, he was awarded an honorary doctor degree from Lafayette College. Uh, born and raised in the city, uh, Sal is the former, Sal's married to the former Pat Cyrils. He has four children and seven grandchildren and lives on Southside neighborhood where they both grew up. Mayor Pano is, is approachable, listens to people, and makes people genuinely feel generally good about the city. With his leadership, Easton is becoming a shining star in the region. Uh, I have a couple, one pers couple personal comments to make. Uh, Sal's mother and my mother were on the same bowling team. I don't know how many years ago. I got a picture <laughs> oh, some, long time, too. somewhere to prove that. Um, he, he's probably served me several times at uh, Sal's Meat Market. And now my grandson, uh, who now knows the mayor, he, he uh, uh, I guess he approached you at one of the Eastern School District functions at, mm -hmm. the, at the stadium, which impressed one of his friends because Sal went over and shook his hand and he said, wow, you know the mayor? <laughs> and my grandson came and told us a week after that, he said, I had a good week. He said, I shook two mayor's hands. He shook Sal's hands and he volunteers for the Phillipsburg Railroad Historian. So the Phillipsburg mayor was there. So my grandson's in the contacting mayors. And I, I believe he may have sent him a letter at one time about something else. So uh, I'll turn it over to Sal. Well, thank you, Neil. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you celebrate 106 years of community service to the, to the city of Easton in the Easton area, uh, I wanted to say a number of things. Um, it's an honor right now to be mayor of the city of Easton, overseeing what is really a renaissance in the city. And uh, we try to attract people downtown 
and they come to our city and, and they don't get raped, robbed, or mugged during the day. And they, they look around, they see what's going on. They say, wow, look at this. I haven't been downtown in 20 years. And what I like is it's the people from the suburbs that are coming downtown. Now, the restaurants downtown, um, they tell me that they're attracting people from as far as away as 70 miles. They can tell by the, the credit cards that they get. So let's talk, I, I think I spoke here before about the history of the city. We're not named Easton because we're the east side of Pennsylvania. We're named Easton because Thomas and John Penn, sons of the William Penn, came around the Mount Ida up from Philadelphia, and they saw this luscious forest area, and it reminded them of their hometown back in uh, England. And so they named, and Thomas Penn was married to Juliana Fermer, who was royalty back then, and she lived in a castle, and the castle's name was Easton Neston. So we became the city of Easton, and it Easton Neston was in Northamptonshire, so the county became Northampton. The county was the third third county. It was Philadelphia County, Bucks County, and then, and then Easton. Easton had a tremendous, a very tremendous and influential um, colonial history. Uh, yes, we have was signer of the Declaration of Independence, but we were also the site of the third reading of the Declaration of Independence. Easton was chosen to be the site of the third reading, and it was downtown in the square on the steps of the courthouse and the courthouse was located on the square when the square was really a square Pendot later came in and made the circle so now we have a circle in a square which <laughs> uh, and last year we had the circle of music you may remember them from the 60s they did red river ball and turn down day and they were named the circle by the beatles john uh lennon came to town to be at lafayette college with the circle and they had the same manager, Brian Epstein. And he gave them the name Circle, spelled the way they spell it in, in England, but because of the rotary in downtown. He said, you should be named the Circle. And so they got their name the Circle. And they were four students from Lafayette College. And they had a band. Um, when I was in high school, they were they were in college. And, I, and they had a band. I remember the band traveling around and did a number of the high school proms. So we had a, a, a really interesting, um, you may have read locally that I'm trying to, the city, not me, but the city is trying to buy the Hooper House. Colonel Hooper was a Revolutionary War hero also. And the Hooper House is one of five remaining 18th century buildings. That, and it's the only one not under public control. We own the, the city of Easton owns the one at Fifth and, North, at Fifth and Ferry, which is the Nicholas House. And Jacob Nicholas used to have the ferry from Pennsylvania, New Jersey, down at Scott Park. And then, of course, the Bachman House, Jacob Bachman, which was, and I don't, I don't like to talk about Allentown about them because they're both great cities and they both have their challenges like we do, um, mostly financial. And but the Sun Inn gets a lot of notoriety in the Lehigh Valley, and the Sun Inn is ninety five percent new, reconstructed, recreated. The Bachman House, in downtown East, is ninety five percent original. So. Uh, my grandson was just in there with a St. James uh, Elementary School fourth graders did a field trip down there to the Signal Museum and the, the Bachman House. And I went down to meet them at the Bachman House. And uh, they were amazed uh, at how beautiful it was and, and what was was uh, being done there. And the docent that was taking them around was very, very knowledgeable about the history of the area. Um, during our history, the 20th century, we became the Industrial Revolution. Actually, the site of the Industrial Revolution in America was down on Lehigh Drive. Lehigh Drive predated Bethlehem Steel. We had a we had a, a, a an iron factory down there, mm -hmm. an iron mill, and um, what's today known as Humor Park was really the first industrial park in in the country. And um, a lot of things was, were done down there. Met um, the city had a steam plant down there that provided heat for all of the buildings downtown on the first floor and underneath the streets. So if you had a steam pipe coming down, for example, Smith Avenue, you would never had any snow on it. But that went away with the flood of 19, before the 1955 flood. Um, and so that's why when I was a kid and when you were all children, the first floor was being used in downtown by stores, but the upper floors were not even used because they could afford to put the heat and air conditioning in the first floor, but not the upper floors. So like right now, New York Taylor's is for sale. New York Taylor's has been downtown Easton for probably over 80 years. New York Taylor's has nothing in the upper floors. It's empty. 
the only place is the retail store because Joe Verdaga's um, father can only afford to heat the first floor. So we're very excited about the colonial history and the industrial revolutionary history he brought us Herman Simone and his brother who came from Union, New Jersey. Now, there's a lot of stories about tax exemptions and rebates and uh, trying to attract businesses. This isn't new. This goes back to the early 1900s when the city of Easton built a factory and then went around and out and tried to get somebody to come in. And they got the Silk Brothers from, or Simone Brothers from Union City to come, New Jersey to come to Easton and create a, a factory that ultimately employed 3,500 people, but was internationally renowned for their manufacturing of silk. They won international awards. That's pretty impressive because we're not known in, in America for making silk. I mean, Japan and China and Europe, Germany, where they came from, but not, not America. But then as we attracted Crayola experience, uh, the Crayola factory, Binion Smith, Binion Smith came to Easton and they manufactured their non-toxic crowns. And it was, they, they actually started out making black chalk and, and chalk for school teachers. That's all they made. And then they got the idea to go into colors. So they came in and they developed this wax, which was called crown, Crayola. And today, I, I, when I go travel around the country, I say I'm the mayor of the most colorful city in the world. Because we have about 70 different colors that they manufacture. They manufacture 3 billion crowns a year. And a billion of them are made with solar energy. So we're really excited. And back as I was leaving office in the 80s and 91, I was able to get Crayola to commit to doing something downtown. Now, I'm not, I don't take credit for Crayola experience. I went there asking Rich Gurren to either build open up a Crayola store or a Hallmark store, getting more retail downtown. And then, and then it morphed into this idea. We hired Abilese Phillips and, and Norman Mintz, who were the um, consultants who oversaw the development of Corning, New York. And if you've been up to Corning, you know that it's a, it, experiencing a wealth of resurgence. So we went and we got them, and it was, it was $50,000 for, for, for them, and I went out to the governor, and it was Bob Casey Sr. at the time. And I said to the governor's secretary, she was Mary, you don't have an appointment. I said, I know, I just need five minutes, just five minutes. So she put me on the schedule at 120 before he would start his 130 meetings. And she gave me 10 minutes. And I went in there, and I, I expressed to the, the governor how important it was that we have a Fortune 100 company here in Pennsylvania that wants to expand downtown, but it's going to cost $50,000. Because Rich Gurren said to me, I want to know if I do, if you do this, that'll occur. And he says, he's a corporate guy. He doesn't just open up stores. He wants to know, if I open up a store, what's going to happen? There's no plan for downtown. So we developed the plan, and, and they developed the plan. And sure enough, it led to the opening of Creole Experience, which you will probably hear more about in the coming months. Or in, But they're doing very well down there. And they attract about 350 to 400,000 people a year from all over the eastern seaboard. I meet people from all over the area. But then after the 20s, when we attracted this industry to Easton, we got into the late 1900s. And very frankly, we were competing against the suburbs. World War II had ended and everybody go west. Go, you know, everybody wanted their acre of land on, on the site. Today, it's a quarter of an acre. But back then, it was an acre of land. And everybody built their houses. And you had all these subdivisions. So our downtown retail stores were competing against the 25th Street Shopping Center, which took a lot of their business. And the 25th Street Shopping Center was then later, 20 years later, was competing against the Palmer Mall, who took all their business. And today, the Palmer Mall is competing against Amazon and mm -hmm. front door delivery. So the thing about retail, what I, I try to tell retailers is that they have to change. Like when I owned my meat market and grocery store on, South, on College Hill, we, the last five years, we went into catering because catering was more profitable than running a store, which was running on 18 19% profit and in a grocery store if you have one percent profitability at the end of the year you are considered successful so catering was was ten percent a year so we went into catering but we had three mistakes that easton in 1900 easton was the largest of the three cities the most influential of the three cities but the largest as well population wise we were at about thirty five thousand population which we we will never get to again because we don't allow growth on 
houses on slopes. So all those houses along Canal Street, they will never be built because they, what they would do is build one floor on the first floor, one room rather, two rooms on the second floor, and three rooms on the third floor. So they would just go up the slope. We don't allow that anymore. So I don't expect it. But we just went over 30,000, which from 24,000 was pretty good. We went over 30,000. And I do get in a lot of trouble for all the development. We have a billion dollars of development in the city. Reason. And we charge for parking and all those complaints. But let me tell you, if you live in Easton, your taxes haven't gone up for 17 years. Your water rates and sewer rates haven't gone up for 17 years. Garbage rates have gone up only because our costs have gone up. But if you look at where we were and where we are, if I had a PowerPoint, which I could have brought, I didn't realize you had a TV here. Um, the PowerPoint presentation shows our assessed value goes up, going up every year. There's two ways of running a city. One, you can run a city that's stagnant with no growth and raise taxes. You have to have additional money every year, just like a business. Your costs go up, whether it's fringe benefits, health care, insurance, utilities, or salaries, it all goes up. And 70% of our budget is salaries. So it all goes up. Or you can grow your economy and keep taxes level. And we've kept them level for 17 years, which prior to coming in office in 2008 was unheard of. I mean, taxes were going up 12 to 20% a year, a year. Now, why wasn't there development? Well, if you're a developer, are you going to go to some place that has an increase every year of five to ten percent? No, you're not going to. You're not going to invest in that area. You're going to find another place to go. You, where is that? The suburbs. It's lots of vacant land, all the parking in the world, and you could build your place and know that your your property taxes probably going to go up for at least five years. We made a couple mistakes. And I don't ever talk about mistakes made by other mayors. I don't, I don't do that because 20 years from now, I don't want them to say, what did Panto do? <laughs> uh, let's face it. I mean, it happens. You, met, you, you think you're doing the right thing and you do the wrong thing. In 1900, the city was the largest of the three cities controlled by the Democratic Party. All right. Wilson Borough, which is one square mile and 8,000 people, were supposed to join the city of Easton. It didn't join the city of Easton. You know why? Because there were a lot of Republicans out there. So it would have tipped the balance of power. All right. So like Bob Dawes, who was a chairman of uh, Palmer Township for a long time, his father lived there. And that's where Bob Dawes grew up. So they had this, this, this need as it's, the city of Easton continued to grow west, like Western Allentown and Western Bethlehem. They had a need for sanitary sewers, water, public water supply. Um, streets, sidewalks, the whole bit. And so they went to the three farmers that were on the board at the at the Palmer Township. And let's face it, Palmer Township back that back then was probably 90% ag agrarian. So they went, oh, we don't do that. You got to go to the city of Easton for that. So they, they, they blocked off one square mile from 15th Street to 25th Street, from the Bushkill Creek to the um, Lehigh River, and said, we're going to be annexed to the city of Easton. And, and the city at the time, cities all across Pennsylvania, had the ability to annex property. But the city fathers sat back and said, eh, I don't know. That, that, you know what? I like being in office. I'm not going to do that. So we didn't do anything. The city of Easton didn't do anything. So two years later, they finally decided, you know what? We'll just, we'll just become our own borough. And we'll take that one square mile, that 8,000 population today. And they became... The borough of Wilson after Woodrow Wilson, who won the presidential election that year. And that's how Woodrow w w Wilson Borough is now separate. And I'm not, I don't want to say anything against Wilson Borough. My, my daughter lives in Wilson. My son, grandson graduated from Wilson, played for Wilson on the baseball team. I believe that there's a certain percentage. I don't ever want to be the size of Allentown. I don't need to be 120,000 people. But 30,000 and 8,000 is too small. You can see what's happened to the borough of Glendon. They have like 400 people and they don't have enough money to pay their costs. And that's what happens well, ever since Bill Walters and Barbara Walters moved out. <laughs> <laughs> you paid the highest tax out there, right, Bill? <laughs> yeah. But, but the fact of the matter is, I believe when I got out of office in 1991, I was put on, I, I, didn't, I didn't lose the election. I, I was put on a voter mandated vacation. So, in other words, I lost. 
<laughs> and but my good friend Tom Goldsworth, he won and 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 did some of the things that I was going to do anyway. So he was very good. Um, I think the thing that happens is that there's a certain size community, and I wanted to get out and I wanted to really decide what is the perfect size community, and how can you pay? For example, Forks, Wilson, Palmer, and Easton all have a ladder truck in the fire department. They're they're a million two. We just ordered one; and it's a million seven now. But we just ordered one, and it'll be here next year. So that's five to six million dollars worth of equipment that is only used for buildings over three stories, and it rolls on all of. Everybody wants to show off their their ladder truck, so it rolls every fire. And think about it: Do we really need five of them? Do we need one and one in backup? I mean, you would save the taxpayers three to four million dollars a year, and. That's what happens when you start to look at that. But I have not been able to get the time to put together the seven budgets that make up the Easton area. Wilson, Palmer, Forks, Glendon, West Easton, Easton, and Williams Township. I wasn't able to put them together. Williams Township is, is still very rural, so we probably wouldn't even talk about Williams Township. But the other six, the three boroughs, the, the city, and the, and the two townships, we would probably look and come up with a size and a I mean, think about the school districts. There's like 18 school districts in Northampton County. I was a school teacher. School taxes go up every single year. Why? Because there's no growth. The growth is over oversteps the, the, the cost of, again, 70 to 80% of their budget is, is salaries and, and, and fixed costs. So if you have three school districts, you only have three superintendents making $180,000 a year. You only have three assist six assistant superintendents. You only have three high school principals. You you cut down. You still need the same number of teachers. You still need the same number of schools because you have that many students. But your your overhead, the 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 higher echelon jobs, you can reduce. So, the city in nineteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, made three mistakes. The first mistake, I believe, was moving the courthouse in eighteen sixty one. From downtown Easton, the courthouse was downtown Easton. All the jurors and all the lawyers had law firms. That, Jeremy's one of four law firms left downtown, probably. You know, and, and but yet we had all the lawyers had. Why? Because they could walk right to the courthouse. In 1861, the courthouse was built way up on the hill. The lawyers protested it because they didn't want. How did you get around in 1861? You walked or you took a horse and you went all the way up these hills. You get up to the steps of the courthouse, and then you got to go up another flight of steps. <laughs> so that was the first mistake. Even in the bad era, the bad days of downtown Easton and downtown Bethlehem and downtown Allentown, Allentown has a federal courthouse and a North An and a county courthouse in their center city. So that brings all the jurors in town, all the lawyers in town, and everybody. You look at the law firms and the, the makeup of the business district in downtown Allentown. It's mostly lawyers, or a lot of lawyers. The second mistake, don't, don't, don't kill the messenger. The second mistake was the city had the ability to annex and didn't. And places like Wilson, West Easton, and, and Glendon should never be existing. They should be part of the city of Easton. Now, Palmer and Forks, you can argue, but when you get out to Allentown, they merge with seven municipalities. Bethlehem merged with five. And so now you have Allentown is 16 square miles. Bethlehem is 18 square miles, and Easton is still four and a half square miles. The only borough that Easton did merge with was the borough of South Easton, where I happen to live, which was its own separate borough back up until 1911 or 12. And the third mistake is something that I've tried to develop, and that is the late 60s and early 70s, that's urban renewal, where half of the downtown was destroyed. Everything south of um, Ferry Street and was basically demolished and nothing was built in its place and i remember when i was a kid going to kutztown i worked for this redevelopment authority for two summers and my job was to go out and talk to these people about how they adjusted to their new home i worked actually for hud and i went to all these lebanese people who cried and were really upset that they had to move and they didn't even own their house ray burkhardt almost <laughs> But they had to move, and they didn't want to move. And I can remember one lady says, we should buy 100 acres and put our church in the middle and all our houses around it. 
Well, fortunately, they kept their church in downtown Houston, so they all come back. So Lebanese Heritage Days, which is the first Saturday, first weekend in August, is very, very popular. But urban renewal destroyed the heart of the city. And everybody talks about the one they romanticize about the past, but every project we developed so far, every project has been on vacant property that was purchased by whether it be the Boyd Theater, where we tore, tore down probably a theater that's even ni was nicer than the State Theater, but wasn't as big. It was only about 800 people. It was beautiful for 55 parking spaces because parking was paramount to everything. You had to have parking. Then we built the Seville, and now you have 70, almost 100 people living there, all making over $70,000 a year, paying taxes and shopping in downtown Easton, walking the streets. So if you come downtown Easton on a weekend, you will see more people walking than you will in Bethlehem or Allentown. I mean, that's just as simple as that. I mean, I hate to say, I don't want to put it down the other cities, but that is true. Downtown Easton this weekend was packed. So those were the, the basically, in my mind, the three mistakes that the city made historically. Now there's other mistakes, but we were also getting ready for Lafayette College. America in 2026 will celebrate its 250th anniversary, and I'd like to have the Hooper House restored by then. To Colonel Hooper, I mean, it would be great. Um, but... Lafayette College will be 200 years old also. Lafayette College, we get a lot, I get a lot of, they, I'm supporting them and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I had all kinds of, it held up the, uh, the, the controversy held up the um, uh, development of the off-campus um, res, uh, res, residence halls. I mean, let's face it. When I went to college, we lived in a 10 by 10 cinder block room. And down the hall, you had a, a communal bathroom. Down the other hall, you had a TV room where you went to watch TV with your buddies. It was it was a 10 by 10. Kids today don't want that. They want their own bed, their own apartment. So they have their own bedrooms, a communal living room with a kitchen. And that's, if you want to compete today to be a, a college, that's where you got to have it. And they go there and they look and then they look at the, the, uh, the, the dorms at Lafayette College and they didn't want to go there. They're not going to pay $70,000 to live in a 10 by 10. So when you look at Lafayette College, they are still the largest taxpayer in Easton, and they're the largest user of water and sewer. Largest taxpayer in Easton, they pay taxes for every all three taxes, city, county, and school, for all their buildings off campus. Their, their initial campus, yes, within, the, within their gates, they are tax-free, which State Representative Bob Freeman is trying to do something about, because... In this city, we have about 45% of our city is tax exempt. We have the college and we have the county. And between the two of them, and the county keeps buying more and more land and tearing down the houses and creating a lot of McAdam parking lots. It's, it's an issue. It's an issue for the future. We talked about the assessed value going up, which means property taxes can remain level. Now, I don't know how, I will tell you right now, and I'm telling you this as a, social organization that is very interested in community development and community support. I don't know how long we can keep that, but I would like to keep it as long as I can so that our tax base, our millage rate, not our taxes, our millage, our millage is 24.95. Oh, man, you can't put it over 25 mils in state law. No, no, state law, our general fund is 12 mils. So I could go up 13 mils without a problem. And actually, because we were on the verge of Act 47, when I took up, we could go to 30 mils. I don't want to do that. I want, because I remember a good friend of mine moved from College Hill to Williams Township. I said, well, at least you're living, you know, your taxes would be less. His taxes were more. Why? Because our common area, whatever that's called, it levels out the common area factor is like, so the house I live in is, I just had it assessed and it was assessed, appraised at rather $490,000 and it's appraised at $66,000. I mean, come on. My house is worth more than $130,000, but that, but according to the tax base, that's what it's worth. So I said, you know, buy, buy, buy me 10 of these. I would rather I'd like to buy 10 of them. I think 
we're going to try to keep taxes as low as, low as we can for as long as we can. Whether that's this year or next year, I don't know. I really don't. But I do know that the development, the two developments that are being done now, the, the marquee, which is under construction now, and the confluence, those two projects worth about $180 million will give the city of Easton about a million and a half dollars a year in taxes. That revenue is real money. So if they were coming online this for 2025, I could say, okay, but they're not. They'll probably, the, the marquee will come on in 2025, but the confluence will probably won't come on in 2027. All I want to do is when I leave office, I want the city to be on a better financial footing than it was when I took office. We were on the throes of Act 47, which is bankruptcy. Um, we had an early intervention plan that said shut down the neighborhood fire stations, shut down one of the pools, and all these other things that they told us to do. And I looked at them, and I did as much of the positive things I could do. But very frankly, we are the only community in the area next to Allentown and Bethlehem that has a fully paid professional fire department. It's cost us more than $10 million a year. We only get eight and a half million dollars in property taxes. Property taxes, if you look at government, local government 101, you're supposed to be able to get enough money in property taxes to pay for your police and fire. We don't even pay for fire, let alone add police in there. Thank you. But the, the problem that we have is that Easton is landlocked. We are no different than Wilson. Wilson's feeling the pinch now. Palmer's going to feel the pinch because they're getting a very little land left to develop. Once you get past, once you are completely developed, you, you have the same problems the city has. Every year your taxes are going to go up because your costs go up. Um, the last thing I'd like to say is about our pension. You know, our city fathers, I get, some of the city employees get mad at me because I keep talking about pension reform. Pennsylvania needs pension reform really bad for municipal employees. I don't know why the administration two before me made, made an issue of letting police and fire out of their, the city pension and into the state pension. I don't know why they did that. And I'm sure they had reasons. And I'm sure they were good reasons. But we can't afford it. We can't afford it. We cannot afford the pensions. When I took office in 2008, our mandatory municipal organization, um, obligation, which is how much money we have to put in addition to the the four percent we're already putting in four percent of salaries. How much additional we have to put in? The state mandates it. It was one point two million dollars on a ten million dollar budget. That's pretty expensive. Today it's eight point seven million. We put more money into our pension fund than we collect in property taxes, and that's why you see other services going up, other costs. The last thing I want to mention is I decided to run for one more term. And this is, my, I've already announced that this is my last term. I'm not running again. And I think I ran because I have a good staff. The staff does all the work. They're, they they carry the ball over the goal line. And Jeremy Series is our assistant solicitor from the assistant solicitors all the way down to our, all the way up to our directors. They do a great job and I can't complain. So they all know that I'm done this in three years. So I, I, I probably start losing some of them because we do not pay our directors as much as other cities. I mean, right now, our city administrator makes about $115,000 a year. I get these things where I get recruited for borough manager. I mean, they're already making $155,000 a year. And they're, they're like 8,000 population. But so I'm, I'm assuming that I'm going to lose some of them, but I don't want, I don't want to. But there's two projects I'm really, very, very happy about. One is the silk mill. I think that has done a great job for Easton. It's a it's a renovation of an existing structure, existing structures. It's also where my mother worked. She worked at Fredwell. And the Carl Stern Arch Trail across the way. I think both of those are projects that we we added. Young people today don't care about anything other than open space and parks. So right now, we're my final three years, I'm working on a, a, a skate park because we don't have a skate park. So we have skateboarders on downtown riding through traffic. We have bicycle people doing wheelies in front of cars and buses. And I want to build a skate park 
and we finally found a location that isn't in a neighborhood, but it's still in the city. I tried 10 years ago to get Palmer, Forks, Wilson, and Easton together, and we were going to put it down at Lower Hackett, which isn't in Easton. you got to leave Easton to get to it. Well, you don't really have to leave Easton. I'm going to let you know a little secret. 13th Street to Hackett's Park, where the mill's going in, that's Easton. Now, we know it's Wilson. They say it's Wil Pfizer, the Pfizer facility where the warehouse is going. They say that's Wilson, but it's really not. We have records that when we had the annexation, power, we annexed from 13th, when, when the Hackett family gave us Hackett Park, we annexed from 13th Street all the way up to, all the, way up to the, the park. I don't think anybody, 70 years later, I don't think I have much of a leg to stand on, but it was that's the way it was. And the last thing I want to do for the kids in the West Ward, and Kathy does a great job over at East Area Community Center, but I want to build a community center. I want to build a modern community center that has a modern um, basketball court with a ceiling that's more than 13 feet high. And so the kids can play and they can compete and have a, a, a computer center. And much as I want it to be a youth center, it's a community center because it's also going to have a senior center. We, we lost the county for some reason. I don't know. I still don't know. My, my dad used to go. My dad's going to be 97 next month. My dad used to go to the senior center at Shaw. They closed the Shaw Senior Center and then they closed the one downtown. So we don't have a senior center, but we need a place where seniors can go and, and get out of their house and talk to people and get a free lunch, a war hot lunch. So that's what we're looking for. And I'll I'll take any questions or any questions that they may have. Yes, Walt. What was the justification for those outcrops that are coming around? It's called traffic calming. Traffic what? Calming. It's to slow people down. What we have right now is the state does not allow cities or municipalities to use radar. It's the only thing that's effective in reducing speed. They don't allow us to use radar, so we've been doing these out crops um we just did on Cattell street and the reason is is the slow traffic down and the traffic engineers tell us it works so i don't know i know Cattell street has become a thoroughfare for forks township and that's the problem there's only one way in and out of forks township when i was with strausser and i built the uh, riverview country club they made us put in a five million dollar Winchester Drive, which goes from Newlandsville Road all the way around down to 611. No one uses it. No one uses it. Once in a while. I use it. Hey, I use it sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Maybe so, once a week. So last week. Oh, I'm sorry. You got to. Oh, go ahead. Oh. So last week, uh, we take our grandkids to the Da Vinci Center, which is oh, downtown mm -hmm. Allentown. Used to be out of the Cedar Crest. It was a real nice area out there. So we snuck over to Allentown, go downtown. Can't find a place to park. I went to the building in the middle of the city. And I said to one of the guys that worked there, I said, why, is, why isn't this place in Easton? I guess this place should be in Easton. And he said, yeah, I should live it. I want to live in Easton. He says, but I can't afford to live in Easton. But anyway, I said, well, anyway, we got into a conversation. How, how did we lose the Da Vinci Center? We lost the Da Vinci Center because they kept moving the goalposts. And I, don't, and I hope Da Vinci does very well in, in Allentown. Um, I don't think they're going to do as well as they would do in Easton. Why? When we won Easton, when Easton won the bid for Da Vinci Center, it was because of our proximity to, out to New Jersey and New York and Connecticut. You can get to us. It's another 40 minutes, 45 minutes by bus to get to Allentown. And it couldn't be done in a school day. So what Da Vinci has to worry about is whether or not they're going to have families coming on weekends. Like we have Crayola during the week. If you go down there right now, it's all school buses coming from summer camps. Weekends, it's families. But during the week, it's it's groups, and that's how we won. And also because originally, remember, it had the aquarium, and it was going to be 140,000 square feet, and it was on three and a half acres where the Days Inn was. As it got shortened and and, and condensed into 70,000 or 65,000 square feet, we couldn't give up three and a half acres. Now, remember, that's going to give us a million and a half dollars a year in taxes, well, about just less than a million dollars in taxes a year. And Da Vinci was going to give us zero. And Da Vinci wanted everything from us. Like Da Vinci's chairman of the board is the CEO of PPL. That's why it's at the PPL center. And that's why they're getting all their, they've not raised any of their money. They've gotten it all from the government. 
And we saw that and, and we just didn't, we gave them as much as we could. We couldn't give them any more, but I wish them luck because I'm, a, I'm still a teacher at heart and science centers are really important for young people to get interested in science. Um, but when they took the aquarium out and it, it, it changed the project and then, and we were still supporting it, but we wanted to move it off of that three acre site down to Larry Holmes is when he built the two story building, we wanted to move it down there and not their board, their director just said, no, we don't, we just don't want, we want to be, we don't want to be down there. I said, well, if you want help from the city, you're going to have to be down there. We're not going to give up a three, acre, three and a half acre site for a 60,000 square foot building with parking all around it. I mean, we did that with Perkins and we did that with a lot of other places. We don't want to do that. So parking has become an issue. And as I said to the lady on my way to work or dinner on Saturday night, she said, Mayor, I couldn't find any parking anywhere downtown. I said, isn't that great? I remember when downtown was dead and you could find all the parking in the world, but our stores were closing because they didn't have any business. So it's a catch-22. I Believe me, I understand it. Go in the garage, which you probably had a problem on Saturday night. Yeah, Saturday night was his due. I mean, I apologize, but we didn't know about the State Theater's camp that had a sold-out crowd. When we have it, we sold out crowd at... at, at State Theater, we put a person down at the gate with the gate up and just let people leave because it's it's just, I have a young staff and they love technology. This is the second, second phase of technology in the parking garages. The first figure was bad, didn't work at all. But if you use your credit card to get in and the same credit card to get out, you will be, it'll take you less than 60 seconds to get in and out. But what happens is I just helped a, a, two families from Scranton out of the garage on 3rd Street. They were there with their kids going to Crayola, and I didn't want them to have a bad experience, so I finally used the key to open the gate and let them out. They were using the wrong credit card, which I found out yesterday that you can't, you got to use the same credit card. So if I pull out my MasterCard and use that to get in, but I pull out my visa to, to leave, it doesn't work. <laughs> Otherwise, no. it just you just scan it and it goes and it opens up and you leave. Sarah, so I just want to update you on the city steam plant because I have a little more knowledge than you do about it. Well, you were living then. Uh, yeah, I was in the oil business. Uh, city steam plant went out after the flood of '55. Med oh, was '55? Med, Med Ed said we're not going to rebuild the steam plant. We want to take the steam down, but it was under the control of PUC. So the Public Utility Commission controlled the fact that. They were providing steam heat. And so what they had to do was every building in downtown East that was supplied with city steam had to get three estimates to put a new heating system in to heat the whole building, not just the first floor. Oh, wow. And we did a lot of quotations. We only ever got one job. Uh, and of course, most of the places got paid to heat the whole building and only put steam in. Uh. But it, it was it was in the early. So uh, people scammed the government back then too. Yeah. <laughs> it was probably in we were, we were married then, so it would have been in the sixties, late sixties, late sixties. Yeah, because yeah. I remember pulling some of the boilers out. But yes, and yeah. as far as silk mills, you tend to forget because you don't realize because you weren't old enough. Because I'm older than you are, we had silk mills where Barry Miles was billboarded yeah. as cemetery curb starts. Yeah. No, silk, that I do remember. There were silk mills down there yeah. in Bushkill Creek that used brick water to operate. And of course, they were torn down in the late 40s when Route 22 came through and built Cemetery Curve. I have my mayor's summer youth camp right now, this week. I took him on a tour of the city and I showed him that area. That was one of the locations we had for Crayola. Uh, we were going to go to the college and see if they would sell or give us that land. Um, the other one, I have a meeting coming up with Father Keith for St. Anthony Square. Um, it's the largest piece of property in West Ward that doesn't, that's available. But the church, Bishop Slurp, I sent him a letter and he said, I'm okay with it as long as you get Father Keith's permission. So we're going to go to the pastor and ask him if he wants to sell it to us. And I'd love to put, I, the problem is we have a site and I have the drawings for the site, but the site is, the, the building is shoehorned into the site. And I know that five years from now, somebody's going to say, what the hell was Panther thinking when he put this building here with no parking? So the, the, 
the place over at Sandy Square would give us parking. Maybe for only 35 cars, but it would give us parking. Other questions? Mr. Mayor. Yes. Hi, good to see you. And I, uh, I want to say you've been one of the best mayors I can think of or in the whole Valley. It's just been a great, a great mayor and you've helped with the museum a lot. So I want to express that appreciation. And I have two questions if I could. Uh, one is uh, uh, about the parking. You know, I can't get my church uh, seniors to come down anymore because the parking was $3 an hour and that adds a lot to lunch. And I wondered if you thought about lowering that price if you'd get a bigger volume to make up for for that. And my second question is, I wondered what the the uh, success factors are to uh, get the Hooper House uh, over to the city. Well, we'll find out where Mr. Clark is going to be helping us get that. And uh, <laughs> so if we don't get it, it's his fault, not mine. No. <laughs> um, the, the congregation, we started... Why did we do when I look at the city budget, which is never there's like a million dollar gap all the time? Sunday's free parking. Why? Because all the people who come into Crayola park on the street first and then in the garage. So we were given Crayola free parking, and frankly, the only thing we get from them is the parking. So, because the city owns the buildings that they're in and doesn't charge any rent. So we we gave we we said okay we can't start at nine o'clock like normal because people go to church and the downtown churches are really important to us so we started at noon so it goes noon to six but we also gave certificates that they just all the congregants all they do is put it on their dashboard and they don't get ticketed so call my office and talk about that because we'll gladly make up those certificates again and give them to you to give out to your congregants the co we don't want the congregation to pay. Our problem is we 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 have like Crayola people, they'll come in and the attendant or, or would say twelve dollars is that an hour? No, that's the, the whole thing. But the the locals they come in twelve dollars. You're gonna be kidding me. So what we do is during the off season of Crayola we lower it to one dollar an hour. During the high season June, July, and August it's up to three dollars an hour, and we do that. We've done that for years. The city of Easton makes parking money on parking. And that's because, frankly, I look at the residents and, and, and they need help. Most of our residents are low, moderate income, and they need help. So what we do is we, we um, basically make about a million dollars a year in, on, on meters and parking in the garages and on the street. And we use that to offset our taxes because a small percentage of the people who park downtown are from the city. They're mostly from the suburbs, have a much better income and can afford and I make no bones about it I, I'm serious I and we get the people from Crayola we are a tourist town so we're not as bad as a as a, as a shore town but we certainly have 300 400,000 people coming into town and at night on Saturday Friday Saturday and Sunday we have a lot of people coming in for our restaurants our restaurants are packed which is a good thing because initially when I first got in office we were opening restaurants and closing them in six months so they are now open and they're doing really, they're doing very well at a buck and a half an hour. And why did we put it up? We didn't put it up because we want to, want to charge you $3. We put it up because we want to charge the workers $3. You know, when I, I'm, I'm in city hall and I see the two ladies from Billy's, they walk out to the street and put quarters in the meter. I'm like, when I worked at the Fox food basket, you, if you got caught parking too close to the front door, you got, you got suspended for three weeks. You didn't get anything. You weren't on any schedule for three weeks. You had to park at the very end of the parking lot. You never park where your customers want to park, but that's what happened. So now that they want to put, put buck and a half an hour, three bucks an hour, go ahead. You work a four hour shift, that's $32. Right. Okay. I just want to say thank you for making yourself so accessible to all of us. And I, I see that you're very appreciative of the community. And this that very often. So I thank you for- Well, I think if you look at mayors across the country they're all there for the right reasons not the wrong reasons you look at congress i may have a difference of opinion <laughs> we got carlos up in the right wing corner. yes hello how's everybody doing uh mayor it's a it's a pleasure to be uh speaking with you um so my my question is uh the preface of my question is for this hour or so that i've been listening to you I've, i'm absolutely fascinated by 
the breadth of knowledge that you have to have for, for this job. Um, and you're looking at things on such a macro level and yet, you know, you're naming streets left and right. You, you know, more streets, uh, than I do in my own town, I'm sure. Um, so, so your, your like awareness of all this stuff is, is fascinating. My question is, um, is there any initiatives to try to get more people to understand how you have to think and, and how, and you're dealing with millions of dollars at a time. Uh, I see millions of dollars in my dreams, but that's about it. <laughs> is there any kind of initiative to make it so more, more of your average people who are busting their butt working every day to put food on the table are aware of these kinds of initiatives? Because I'll tell you what, I'm never going to get bugged about the parking again, because you just said you make a million dollars off the meters and that money offsets taxes. That's exactly what I want to hear. I'm happy to pay the, the meter now because you said that. Do you see what I mean? Like, is there an initiative to get, is there a way even to get more people to hear what you're saying to make it easier to process this? Well, I appreciate the, the, the comments and the question. Um, I think the best way, I'm going through a stage of my career, which is really horrible. We no longer have local newspapers and we no longer have local radio stations. So it's hard to get the word out. What we're looking at right now is a place to put a digital sign like they have at Palmer Township at 25th Street, 25th and Northampton, to put four or five of those out in neighborhoods so that we can communicate with people. Like, I had a cruise night this past Saturday night with a band, Lucky Seven, that I paid $1,300 for, and I I didn't have enough people there. I had people who were normally be down there for dinner and stopped to listen to the music, and everybody loved it, but, oh, I know you had a cruise night. I know you had a cruise night. I needed to, I needed to get the word out, and there's no way to get the word out anymore. So I think what I do is I do, like this week is my summer youth camp, I try to bring kids in, young people, who are interested in the city. To, this afternoon, they're going to they're going to tour the water plant, see how we purify the water for eighty five thousand dollars, eighty five thousand people, and then after that, they go right down to the wastewater plant to see where we repurify it to put it back in. The good news is that Easton is purifying the water at the wastewater plant better than what we're taking it out of the Delaware. It goes back in better than we cleaner than when we take it out. We try to explain that, how we do our budget when we have our budget message. So, and my budget message is online, but it's hard to, I mean, it's hard unless you work with it every day to understand it. It really is. But I will do everything I can to put it on non-residents rather than residents. Well, and, and what just occurred to me as a follow-up, if I may, is, um, you know, for me, I, I'm a small business owner. I run a, a nonprofit as well. Um, so it, it could be on me as well as any small business owner to, to, I'm, you know, I'm thinking out loud here, but have, have a video of you saying, you know, the gist of what you expressed, maybe a five minute version of what you expressed, maybe, uh, you know, a video of you explaining quickly, like what's coming up in the city. And I could put that, I, I could use that and say, here's a quick message from our mayor, you know, like the idea that we could team up a small business and, and the mayor's office to just gently express to the common, you know, uh, you know, person living here, this is what we're up to. And, and this is the kind of stuff that our mayor is, is doing. And, and guys, if you notice the, the parking meters going up, don't worry, here's where that money's going to go. You know, I, I think there's something about the messaging that, especially you mentioned young people. I love the idea that young people are getting more interested in, in local government and not, uh, less interested, you know, because they're the ones who are going to are going to push those kinds of initiatives. I, I, I think it's very cool. I'm, I'm excited about maybe uh, pushing that kind of idea forward. It's a great idea. It's a good suggestion. Thank you. I'll listen. I'll look for that. See if we could do it. We love social media. Yes. We see anything in, in um, Northampton Street heading up the hill and over the hill and, and, and any growth going out that way. Just yes, as a matter of fact, we're looking hill. right now, we're going to put a bike lane going out up over the hill from the circle to 15th Street because um, bicycle safety is very important. Um, and we have development taking place on the 500 block of Northampton and over the, down to the old Jacobs Produce. Yeah, That yeah. is getting developed. And But the one in between, I don't know, uh, Ari Schwartz owns it and he 
everybody raves about the Dutchtown Commons because it has a grocery store. Well, if it doesn't get built, you don't have a grocery store. And it's been he he talked to Phil Mittman before me. So and I've been here older than I'm older than dirt. So I've been here for 17 years and, and I don't see it. Um, we 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 work really closely with our developers. Um, Mark Mulligan, who did the Sloan Silk Mill, who did the Pomeroy building, um, he always says, the mayor doesn't even go out to lunch. I've never even taken the mayor out to lunch. What are you talking about? When the, when the press would say, oh, you're too tight with the developers. I don't, I don't, I try not to get too close, but I want to be close enough to be able to make suggestions and move them in a direction that's good for the city. And I think that's a really important. And when we did the silk mill, and Mulligan got the VM development got the opportunity to do that. Talk about the P word. All right. We talked a lot about parking. I call it the P word because you get on P word and you're on it for hours. Down there, they had 90 more spaces than required by our own zoning code. And today you can't park there because the businesses are so successful. And then they have all the residents. But um How about I, the old armory building down the there. The armory is 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 under under construction right now, they're in the planning stage. I think it's going to be an event center for smaller events. The people who own Daddy's owns that, and of course, Daddy's is so busy. So they're going to they're looking at it. And those boys, they do all their own work. Mm -hmm. So they've been in there. They took all the paint off the stone. Um, they used um, a rubber pellet instead of sand to get the get the paint off. And um, they have plans to to uh, the lower level they're using right now for storage. And the middle level is where they want to put their event center. I don't, I don't know if you'll see it, but you should see something happen. They, they did put the new roof on and they put the new windows in. When they're finished the job, I may not even be in office. <laughs> you might run again. But it's no. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I will just say this. My staff caught me last two weeks ago. They said, what if Tybo Sultana is the only other candidate? I said, then I'll run. So they're, yeah, four more years. Running. No, no, I'm not running because they're lining up already. And I said, guys, I have three and a half years left. But there's at least two councilmen that I know are going to run. And there's a couple of people in the community that I know are going to run. So let them run. <laughs> I'm not running. I'm done. Hey, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere, Dan. I'm here. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. Thank, for, you. Uh, thank you all. Yeah, it's great, uh, great to hear. Great to hear about our. Uh, great to hear about a wonderful city. I mean, I don't know about you all, but I, anybody you run into, you know, they're, hey, your restaurants are so good. What's happening downtown Easton? It's just a, it's just a great, great story. So it's great to see people from Allentown and Bethlehem coming to Easton, because we all went to them, and there's a lot of people from the Pocono, Stroudsburg area that come down too. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big, uh, big area as well. So uh, thank you so much.